All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about the biliary system, and we're going to finish off talking about the types of jaundice. It's really important that we have a very good clinical correlation between this kind of biliary tree, hepatobiliary tree, and that we truly understand uh, the different types of jaundice. So let's go ahead and get started on that. If you guys haven't already, please make sure you guys go see our video on the biosynthesis and uh, xenobiotic metabolism, and also our videos on the liver physiology with uh, metabolism, storage, and even the protein synthetic function. But really, really please make sure you see the xenobiotic metabolism and primarily the biosynthesis uh, one because it's gonna go hand in hand with this video. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over very briefly, because we have already talked about it in a good detail, the bile system. Again, what are some of those components of bile that we talked about? The big one was our bile acids, okay? Those were the big ones. Again, remember that was derived from cholesterol, cholic acid and chinodeoxycholic acid. Another really big uh, component was phospholipids. And if you remember, we said one of the main ones was called phosphatidylcholine. There's also phosphatidyl and acetyl and uh, phosphatidylserine and phosphatidic acid, but the main one is phosphatidylcholine. There's also gonna be cholesterol. There's going to be tons and tons of different drugs that we can metabolize and excrete into the biliary system. There's going to be a lot of water, electrolytes, amino acids, glutathione, which you remember was one of those antioxidant molecules. So tons of different components, and that's what I wanna talk about. I don't wanna go over their synthetic pathways. I just wanna talk about how they're secreted, what is the transporter that is secreting them, because those are important, unfortunately. So I wanna talk first off, how do we get these substances in? How do we secrete these substances? And then where do they flow? Okay, so let's go ahead and start on that first. So let's say the first thing that we talk about is how can we bring certain molecules into the cell that is necessary for the bile formation? Well, if you look here, you have this blue transporter, okay? This blue transporter right here is actually called an NTCP transporter, N-T-C-P transporter. What does that stand for? We're gonna use a lot of abbreviations today, okay? NTCP is the sodium torocholate transporter. Simply, it's responsible for taking up bile acids. That's it. I don't want to make it any more complicated than that. And we're going to represent bile acids as BA. So there's our bile acids. These transporters are primarily responsible for taking up bile acids. And they do it by bringing sodium with them. Okay, so that's their function. They bring into the cell bile acids. And again, if you want to remember, in order for them to be able to do that, we have to bring sodium into the cell as well as a co-transport mechanism. Okay? So that's one thing that we bring in. And again, how does this bile acids get into the circulation? Where did it come from? Well, if you remember, we talked about it very briefly in the bile synthetic pathway is that if you remember bile acids, they're gonna be excreted into this biliary system. They're gonna go down through the biliary tree, down the common bile duct, and then out into the intestines. And then once those bile acids are in the intestines, you know that they perform emulsification of a bunch of different lipids. But then afterwards, they get to the terminal ileum and they get absorbed, taken back through the hepatic portal circulation and back to the liver. So what do you think that transporter right there is? This is again a sodium torocholate transporter and its responsibility is for bringing bile acids and again if you really want to remember the n is for the sodium to bring in via a symport mechanism or a co-transport mechanism okay again we'll review that afterwards a little later but that's one thing the next thing in this pink this is actually going to be a organic anion transporter protein, organic anion transporter protein. What do you think that they bring in? Organic anions. What are some of these? The main one I want you to remember is various different drugs. They bring up tons and tons of different types of drugs. And if you really want to remember, they also can bring up some bile acids too. Okay. So remember that when we talk about the organic anion transporter, their primary function is bringing into the cell drugs primarily, but as well as bile acids. And again, you've already seen that we can bring bile acids in through the sodium 
torocholate transporter. All right. Now, another one is called the organic cation transporter protein. So now that you have this one here in red, this is the organic cation transporter. What do you think they're responsible for? Bringing in organic cations. And these are tons and tons of different drugs. So again, more drugs. Okay, so we can bring in tons of different types of drugs um, as well as many different types of uh, di organic anions into the cell. One more that is really important, you can't forget this one, okay? This one right here, super important. This is responsible for bringing bilirubin into the cell. Okay, it's responsible for bringing bilirubin into the cell. So this right here is a bilirubin transporter. So it's right here, bilirubin transporter. Now. These are usually of two different flavors. They're usually electrogenic or electroneutral channels. These are gonna be bringing bilirubin, but the question I want you guys to ask yourself is where the heck is that bilirubin coming from? That's what I want you to ask. So now we have to take a little bit of a break here, come over to this area, and we need to talk a little bit about the bilirubin metabolism. If you guys remember, we said that bilirubin was the breakdown product of the heme in hemoglobin. Why was that important? Because we said that there was particular cells located within the uh, spleen, as well as you can find other different cells in the liver and even a little bit in the bone marrow. Anywhere there was what's called sinusoidal capillaries. Let's write that down. Wherever there is those sinusoidal capillaries, and if you remember, there was three primary places for that. One was the bone marrow, one was the liver, and the other one was the spleen. But if you guys remember, we said that the most important one is the spleen because this is going to be where a lot of red blood cell degradation is occurring. All right, that is important. Please don't forget the spleen. So we're gonna assume that this organ right here is the spleen. And what we have here is we have this mega, megasaurus uh, macrophage. This macrophage, let's assume that we have an old age and defective red blood cell, super old. The dude's like freaking walking around with a cane. He's like 100, 120 uh, days old. Once that happens, this red blood cell has reached his end point. So let's say here we take a red blood cell. And this red blood cell, it's time to get destroyed, buddy. Now, if you remember, there was one really important component within the red blood cell that we care about. And that is called, here, right here on the side, hemoglobin. If you guys remember, hemoglobin accounts for like 97 to 98% of the red blood cell contents. When we break the hemoglobin down, we break it down into two components. All right, pretty simple stuff. Heme and globin. And it's pretty simple that we know that the globin is broken down into amino acids and it can be sent to various tissues to be recycled. Maybe like the bone marrow to use it to make more hemoglobin. Maybe the actual macrophage will use it to synthesize proteins, whatever it might be. Maybe it goes to the liver and the liver uses it to make proteins. It doesn't really necessarily matter, but I want you to understand that that's what's happening to it. Now the heme is the one that we care about. It gets broken down into two components. The first component is called biliverdin. So the heme, it actually is made up of a nice pigment called protoporphyrin but it gets broken down into what's called biliverdin. And then biliverdin is converted into what's called bilirubin. And I'm gonna represent that here with a B. Okay, we're gonna use it as a B here. Now, there's particular enzymes that are catalyzing these steps. What are some of these enzymes? For example, taking the heme and degrading it into biliverdin, this is called heme oxygenase. And then the enzyme that's converting biliverdin into bilirubin is called biliverdin reductase. Now, the bilirubin, once it's done being metabolized with inside of the actual macrophage, we're going to take that bilirubin and put it into the general circulation. Again, we're going to represent it with that B. Now, the liver is so kind to us that it makes a protein that will actually bind onto 
that bilirubin, because bilirubin is unfortunately not very hydrophilic, it's not very water soluble, and we also don't want it to be circulating around because it can actually get into the central nervous system and cause some pretty nasty damage if not bound to albumin. So what we do is we produce this plasma protein here called albumin, one of the really main proteins of the liver, and the albumin will come and actually bind with the albumin. Now, this type of bilirubin, okay, this type of bilirubin, it's really important that we really get an understanding of this. I can't, can't stress this part enough. This bilirubin, which is bound to the albumin, is called, there's two names for it. You can call it unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. Don't forget that, okay? So this type of bilirubin, which is bound to the albumin, is actually called unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. All right, sweet. Now, just to finish off this concept here, what happens to the other component of the heme? Well, if you remember, we said that that's broken down into the actual biliverdin, but also we can't forget about the iron. The iron has to do what? We got to take the iron, we could do two things with it. One is we could take that iron, put it into the circulation. Let's say down here, here's the iron. And we don't want the iron just circulating on its own. We don't want it just kind of rum rummaging through the blood because it can cause a lot of free radical reactions. So the liver, again, is so kind to us. And guess what it does? It produces a protein that will bind to the iron and prevent it from actually circulating on along in its free form. What is that protein called? This protein is called transferrin. All right, so that's one big thing. So some of the iron can actually get put into the blood, but we can't just have it circulating on its own. We have to bind it to transferrin. Or we could take that iron, and if you remember, we bind it with another molecule, which is called apoferritin. So this is called apoferritin. And when the apoferritin combines with the iron, it makes what's called ferritin, all right? Then, if we take a whole bunch of ferritin molecules and combine them together, then we're going to get one big clump of stuff, and that's called hemocytorin. All righty. So that's important that we really get an understanding of this stuff um, with respect to the uh, red blood cell metabolism because it does play a role in one of the types of jaundice. All right. But the main component that we were, were focusing on is the bilirubin. I want you guys to really keep in track of all the bilirubin, where it is, where it's made, where it's being secreted, all that stuff. Now, this unconjugated or indirect bilirubin, what is it gonna do? It's gonna come over here and get taken up through the liver, right, through this bilirubin transporter. So what will happen is the albumin will actually come off of the, it'll actually disassociate away from the bilirubin, and then again, what will it go to? It'll go back to the free-formed albumin, okay? Now, that unconjugated or indirect bilirubin, when it's taken up by the liver cell via these bilirubin transporters, we have to send it somewhere in the cell. So we send it to this nice little organelle called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So now here's our bilirubin, okay? That bilirubin will then get taken up into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. As it goes through the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, there is a particular enzyme that it has to interact with. If you guys remember, we talked about this in xenobiotic metabolism. Again, a reason why it's important is this enzyme here. It's one of the phase two enzymes, all right, of the biotransformation. This is called UGT, UDP glucuronosyl transferase. And if you remember, what is it responsible for doing? It's putting a glucuronate group onto the bilirubin. What does that do? It makes it more polar, which allows for it to be more hydrophilic, more water soluble, which is what we want. So now as a result, let's say here I take and I put my bilirubin here, and what did I add on to it now? Let's put over here a nice little bond to a glucuronate. Okay, and that glucuronate, let's put like this out here. If you guys remember, we kind of represent this as being a charged molecule. Now, out of here, out of here, that conjugated bilirubin is going to get excreted 
out of the actual cell, okay? So we took the bilirubin up through this bilirubin transporter. We sent it into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to get acted on by the UDP glucuronosyl transferase, become conjugated, and then now that it's in the liver cell, the liver cell is going to excrete that conjugated bilirubin out here into the biliary system. So again, here's our conjugated bilirubin. All right, now let's write this one down because again, it's important. What kind of bilirubin is this called? This is called conjugated or direct bilirubin. Again, you can't forget these things. Here, I'm gonna do this so you guys don't forget the difference between these two. So this one right here where the bilirubin is just on its own, it's not really conjugated to anything, it's called the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. And this one over here where it's bound to the glucuronate is called the conjugated or direct bilirubin. It's super in, uh, important in being able to diagnose different types of jaundice. All right, now that we've talked about the things that can bring these guys across the membrane, and let's say that, again, let's say here's this big, unusually shaped hepatocyte. This side of the hepatocyte is facing the actual blood. So let's assume that this side is the sinusoidal membrane. Okay, let's assume that this side is the sinusoidal membrane. So this side is the basolateral membrane, where there's a lot of microvilli, and then there's the space of DISI. This over here, this side, and this side right here where the biliary system is, that's the canalicular membrane. So all this is the canalicular membrane, okay? And that's the apical surface. So don't forget that. Remember that from the liver histology video. Okay. So now we have these bile acids, we have drugs, we have different types of bilirubin, many different substances that we brought into the cell. And now we have this conjugated bilirubin. Now, what is the name of this transporter? You can't forget this transporter. Super important, especially when it comes to a familial disease. This one right here is called MRP2. It is called an MRP2 transporter. What that stands for is multi-drug resistant associated peptide type two. This is really important because there is a disease where this actual transporter is defective and it's not able to push the conjugated bilirubin into the actual biliary system. It's called Dubin-Johnson syndrome. So what is that called here? Let's put this right over here. An MRP2 defect, it's a familial disorder, okay? This, if that is the case, if there's a defect in this, it can produce a disease called Dubin Johnson syndrome. It's not necessarily fatal at all, okay? But what it does produce is think about this. Think about it just logically. This transporter is responsible for putting the conjugated bilirubin into the biliary system. If it can't do that, where will it go? Well, eventually it's going to get pushed into the general circulation. So what's gonna to happen to the conjugated bilirubin inside of the actual blood? It's gonna go up. So what you'll see is whenever you're doing like blood work and stuff, you'll see that they have a elevated conjugated bilirubin. That's gonna be elevated in the blood. Another thing which is interesting with this disease is that usually it doesn't represent no elevated liver enzymes. So there's usually no elevated LFTs. Okay, liver function test, right? If you do this, your AST, ALT, GGT, ALP, those are usually all normal, okay? But again, thought I should mention that one there. Again, it's usually a defect in the MRP2. There is another one over here, not as important, but th this actual transporter, OATP, organic anion transporter, there is a disease called Rotor's syndrome which can happen if this transporter isn't effective at being able to take up conjugated bile acids. And so sometimes that can cause some, a mixture of conjugated and unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Not necessarily that important though, okay? All right, so now let's talk about one more thing, okay? On the cytosoidal membrane before we go to the canalicular membrane. You see this transporter right here? There is a lot of research nowadays that is suggesting that there's actually transporters located on the sinusoidal membrane that play a role with the efflux of different types of xenobiotics, drugs. And this transporter is called MRP4, and they even think that it might also be another one called MRP6. 
And what these transporters are responsible for doing is, remember from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, there was the cytochrome P450 complex. And what was it doing? It was taking different drugs and trying to make them more water soluble. And what did we do with them? We hydroxylated them, we conjugated them, and then what did we do with those drugs? We pushed those drugs either onto the canalicular membrane, into the bile to be excreted, or we can push those drugs into the blood. Maybe someone's taking cardiovascular drugs, right? And they need that drug to be into the circulation to go to the heart to cause whatever effect it might be. So that's the aspect here is that when we, the liver takes up a bunch of different drug molecules, let's say that that's that drug right there, goes into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, undergoes its biotransformation process, and then it gets excreted into the blood in its active form, which then can go and work on the heart, okay? And just as an example. So that's important to remember is that there is another transporter like MRP4 and MRP6 that do play a role in the efflux of xenobiotics or drugs into the circulation. All righty, that covers that aspect. Now, we know what we have here. One more thing, one last thing here. These are not the only things that we have coming into the liver, right? There's also other substances that are coming into the liver as well. All right, now, what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna talk about the excretion of these substances. So we've seen how we've been able to take them up. We've seen the modification of the bilirubin. Now what we need to do is we can need to see how we can excrete these substances. So now let's go through systematically, step by step, and talk about the different types of things that we're secreting. So if you remember, what does the liver have a lot of? has a lot of cholesterol that it can store up, right? And it can use it, it can get that cholesterol from you know, endogenous pathways like the LDL, HDL, or it can get it from chylomicrons via the exogenous pathway, things that we ingest. Either way, or we can synthesize cholesterol even too because of excessive amounts of acetyl-CoA, right? So either way, you can have lots of cholesterol present within the liver. Well, there's transporters to prevent this excessive cholesterol buildup and they're located on the canalicular membrane. Again, this is the canalicular membrane. This is the sinusoidal membrane. This transporter here is responsible for pushing the cholesterol out, and this is called ABC5, and then there's another one, which is ABC8. And all these are is they're ATP cassette binding proteins. They're just special proteins that are going to be responsible for translocating these different substances into the biliary system, so that's one. Another thing is the liver also is synthesizing tons of different fatty acids, if you guys know that, right? So let's say that we have lots of fatty acids here. And those fatty acids, we can convert them into different types of phospholipids, right? We know that. The particular phospholipid that we, liked to, we talked about was called phosphatidylcholine. Right? We said that this was one of the big ones. And there is a transporter that takes this phosphatidylcholine and puts it out here into the biliary system. What is the name of that transporter? This transporter right here is called MDR3. Okay, multi-drug resistant protein type 3. Now there's another one over here, this blue guy. And this guy is responsible for secreting tons and tons of different types of bile acids. So this can have tons of bile acids that it can secrete or bile salts. So this is called the bile salt export pump. So all these bile acids that we take in or that we synthesize, all of those different bile acids, whether they're primary or whether they're secondary, we can take these bile acids and pump them in to the actual canalicular system. And again, remember these can be primary or secondary. What else is there? There's also things that we can wanna excrete out here. Drugs, there's tons of different drugs that we wanna push out here. So this purple guy is representing the different drugs that we wanna excrete. So this guy is really important. He is called MDR1, multi-drug resistant peptide type one. And this is responsible for secreting tons of different types of xenobiotics, tons of different types of drugs. Okay, so let's just refer to this as drugs. All right, and we're pumping that bad boy out there too. Okay, and again, these assume that these xenobiotics have been modified via the P450 system and the conjugation phase one and phase two. The next one here is this orange, whoopsie. And this guy's also really important. He's really interesting. He's called the breast 
cancer-resistant peptide. And the breast cancer-resistant peptide is responsible for secreting a lot of steroid hormone derivatives and pushing them out here. So tons of different types of steroid hormone derivatives and even certain drugs as well, we can secrete these bad boys out into the canal molecular system. There's one last one that I want to mention here before we go into this guy again that we've already talked about. It's also copper. If you guys remember, we excrete a lot of copper and we can excrete some of the iron. So some of the other things that we can use is we can excrete copper and we can excrete iron. And usually these are through like different types of vesicles and stuff like that that we actually fuse with the membrane to excrete these substances out, okay? So that's important to remember as well. The last one that we talked about, we've already mentioned it over here, it's the MRP2. And what is the MRP2 doing? Again, don't forget it. The MRP2 is responsible for taking the conjugated bilirubin. Let's draw that again, just to make sure that we're emphasizing that, bilirubin. And what is it bound to? It's bound to that glucuron A group, which is superpolar. This conjugated bilirubin can be excreted via this MRP2 molecule. Okay, so let's draw this out here. And again, what is this molecule here called? It is called conjugated bilirubin. All right, so now we have a pretty good understanding of the main substances of the bile. There is other things that we can push into the biliary system. What are some of the other things that we can push into the biliary system? We've said before that there can be a lot of water. There's different aquaporins that we can utilize to push water in there. We can take and push tons of different types of electrolytes. For example, maybe some sodium, maybe some chloride, maybe even some bicarbonate, okay? And we can excrete these substances in here. We can even push out in there maybe some amino acids. Maybe we wanna push some amino acids in here. We can do that. We can even secrete out here glutathione. Okay, glutathione, which is that natural antioxidant. We can excrete certain waste products, like maybe nitrogenous waste products like urea. We can even excrete that bad boy. But here's one that I really don't want you to forget about. We can also secrete, let's do this one in pink here so you don't forget it. We can also excrete out into this area IgA antibodies. And these are important because they prevent a lot of bacterial overgrowth within the uh, biliary system. Now, the liver isn't making these antibodies. Don't forget that the Ig antibodies that are being secreted are not made by the liver. They're made by plasma cells. The liver takes these Ig antibodies up and then secretes them into the biliary system. And some of these cholangiocytes, the cells that are lining the biliary ducts, they might even be able to release a little bit of that IgA as well. Okay? So now that covers that. We should now have a very, very good idea about how to get these substances taken up to the cell, where those substances come from for the most part, how they're being excreted. Now let's talk about where they're going. The liver synthesizes on average approximately 900, millibe 900 milliliters of bile per day. It's a decent amount of bile. So we can refer to this as a hepatic bile, the bile that is being made by the liver. Now, this 900 milliliters, a good chunk of it will go into the gallbladder. About 450 milliliters of that bile that is made by the liver will go into the actual gallbladder. The remaining amount will go down through this biliary system and be within this biliary system until the next, until we need. Like for example, there's some type of stimulus from the intestines like cholecystokinin to cause that bowel to be released. But now let's just review our anatomy here. Okay, let's say that this is our biliary canaliculi. Coming out of the liver is this duct right here. Okay, this main one. This main one right there is called the common hepatic duct. You know that that's draining the liver, okay? Then as it comes out of the liver, it actually fuses with another duct here. This duct right here, we're gonna say that fuses with the common hepatic duct, this one right here. We're gonna assume that this one is called the cystic duct. When the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct fuse, they make this duct right here. And this bad boy is called the common bile 
duct. Then the common bile duct comes all the way down here and it fuses with this duct right here. What's this duct right here called? This main duct right here is called the main pancreatic duct. They also call it the duct of Worsing, right? Pancreatic duct. It fuses with the common bile duct right here. And when it fuses, it makes more of this like dilated region right here. What is this dilated region right here called? This is called the hepatopancreatic ampulla, the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Then the hepatopancreatic ampulla is actually surrounded by this ring of smooth muscle. Okay, what is this ring of smooth muscle here called? This ring of smooth muscle here is actually called the sphincter of Odie or the hepatopancreatic sphincter. This controls the opening of the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and if it's actually designed to be open, it can release these bile contents out into the actual small intestine, primarily in the duodenum, right? Now, we have an idea of where this bile is coming. Now, we said 900 milliliters of the bile is actually going to be produced by the liver. A good chunk of it, 450 mils, is going to go into the gallbladder, okay? The remaining amount will go down the common bile duct system. Now, let's assume that the person is eating. Okay, so they've ingested food. So there's different, there's protons in the intestine, there's fats in the intestine, there's carbs in the intestine, there's proteins in the intestine, bunch of different substances. But all these things, what do they do? They stimulate particular cells. You know some of these cells, they're actually gonna be secreting what's called secretin. And another really important one is actually called cholecystokinin. If you remember, what did secretin do? Secretin was responsible for doing two things. One is that actually, let's follow it up here. It's responsible for stimulating all of these different bile synthesis pathway. So bile synthesis, that's his, his function, okay? So secretin is designed to tell the liver to start synthesizing tons and tons of bile. Another thing that it can do is it can stimulate these cells. You see these cells here, we call them cholangiocytes. So what do you call these cells here that line the biliary ducts? We call them cholangiocytes. These guys can be stimulated by secretin, and guess what secretin can do? It can take up a bunch of different types of water substances. So maybe it might pull out water. But actually, one of the big things, can't forget this, one of the big things that it actually does, it actually causes these cholangiocytes to secrete a ton of different bicarbonate to really help to make this bile nice and alkaline so that whenever the bile is pushed out here into the intestines, what is there a lot of in the intestines right now? A lot of protons. So if we have a lot of bicarbonate, we can neutralize that acidic chyme. So that's important. And again, he also tells the pancreas to make a lot of bicarbonate rich uh, pancreatic juice. Now the CCK, what is he doing? CCK also can help with secretin's function to stimulate the liver to make bile. But one of the big things for this dude is he tells the actual smooth muscle that controls the gallbladder to contract. And when it contracts, again, we're eating right now. Okay, let's assume that we're in the fed state right now. We're consuming food. When the actual gallbladder is contracting, it's gonna eject a lot of its bile out into this biliary system. But here's what I want you guys to be asking yourself. What is the difference between the bile that is made by, that is not made, but the bile that is, uh, in the gallbladder and the bile from the liver. The difference is the gallbladder is responsible. Let's say that we're in the fasting state now. Okay, let's just track back and let's assume that we're in the fasting state. During that time period, what the uh, gallbladder is doing is it's pulling out a ton of water. It's pulling out a lot of sodium. It's pulling out a lot of chloride. And it's actually excreting in here lots of bicarbonate. By doing that, what is the function of this? We're getting rid of a lot of the non-essential stuff, in other words. We're trying to make the bile more concentrated. So the bile present within the gallbladder is going to be concentrated bile. Lots of bile salts, lots of phospholipids, and things of that nature, and less of these water and electrolyte substances. So the bile formed by the, or made by the gallbladder, or I should say stored by the gallbladder, is super concentrated while the bile in the, made by the liver is more diluted, if you wanna think about that, okay? 
Now we got that down. Let's go back to the we're eating again. Okay, so we're eating food. Obviously, you know that the cells responsible for secreting CCK can be stimulated by certain substances like fats and uh, proteins and even some carbohydrates. And they can come over here and stimulate the liver to contract, expelling that concentrated bile out here into the biliary system. So now what are we going to have? Well, before there was the hepatic bile, which was more dilute. And then here's the concentrated bile from the gallbladder. Now we're going to have a mixture of hepatic and diluted bile. That's kind of interesting. Now, another thing that CCK does is, CCK also comes down here to the sphincter of OD. Causes him to relax. When he relaxes, guess what starts coming out? Bile. And a lot of it. And that bile is going to mix with a lot of this intestinal substances and help to aid in the digestion and the absorption of these different types of substances, okay? So that's important to remember. Other things that you could remember just as a, as a side here is that acetylcholine also has the ability to stimulate gallbladder contractions and acetylcholine has also been found to stimulate the sphincter of OD relaxation via the parasympathetic nervous system, like the vagus nerve, okay? So that's important to remember as well. So now, we've followed it down to that part. So now we're down here. Let's follow it just a little bit longer. I promise we're gonna get to the good stuff, the disease stuff now. So let's look over here now. Okay, now we have the bile. The bile has been excreted into the actual small intestine now. One of the main things about the bile is there's two big things. Obviously, it's going to help to with the emulsification of fat, right? We talked about that in our digestion absorption of lipids. If you haven't seen it, go see it. But one of the big things is that those bile acids, whether they were conjugated or um, uh, not conjugated, they can be recycled. How much of these bile acids that we excrete can be recycled? 94%. 94% of these bile acids that we secrete are actually going to be recycled and then taken up. They're actually absorbed in the ileum. So let's say that this is the ileum, the distal part of the small intestine. This can actually get retaken up by the ileum through the portal vein and taken back to the liver. What is this circulation called here? If you follow it, watch this. Here's the bile acids being absorbed. They're being taken up by the liver, and then we're secreting the bile acids going back down here. We're making a circuit. What is that circuit called? This circuit is called the enterohepatic circulation. So that is important, all right? There's other things that can actually be taken up here as well. One of the things that we can actually have taken up is maybe some of the bilirubin, but let's talk about the bilirubin first. So now we have that bilirubin down here, right? Now the bilirubin is going to get metabolized by a lot of different types of bacteria. Okay, so when it gets broken down, it gets broken down by different types of bacterial enzymes, they're proteases. And what it does is it breaks it down first from the bilirubin, it breaks it down to what's called uro bilinogen. And then urobilinogen is then going to be broken down into what's called stercobilinogen. And then it can get further oxidized into what's called stercobilin. This can all happen in the intestines. Now this stercobilin is what causes the brown feces, the brown pigmentation of the feces, which again is a clinical indicator. A lot of this is going to go into that, to forming the actual stercobilin. But a percentage of it is actually going to get reabsorbed and taken back to the liver and utilized by the liver to make more bile or guess what? Some of that urobilinogen, the liver can take up and put into the circulation. So let's say that again, it comes back to the liver through the enteropathic circulation and then we take it and actually, uh, it gets back into the circulation. And here it is. Let's write it right here. Euro, I'm going to put UB. UB is urobilinogen. The urobilinogen, again, what can happen? It can get taken up, absorbed at the actual small intestine via the ateropatic circulation, 
Some of it can get taken out by the liver. Some can go into the circulation and get taken to the kidneys. The kidneys will filter that urobilinogen and actually excrete it out into the urine. So what are we going to see in the urine? Urobilinogen, okay? Now, along the way, urobilinogen is acted on by different enzymes and oxidized into what's called urobilin. So really, if we want to be particular, this substance, which is actually in the urine, is called urobilin. And this is what causes that yellow pigment of the urine. All right. We have covered a good amount of stuff, I think, that is now necessary for us to really understand the different types of jaundice. Now, next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about the different types of jaundice, but I want you guys to just, for every single one that we cover, follow the Billy Rubin. Follow the Billy Rubin. So let's talk about the first type of jaundice. Now, here, before we actually do that, shame on me, what is jaundice? How would you define jaundice? Jaundice is basically when there is an abnormal pigmentation or hue of the, the skin, okay, the sclera, and maybe even a little bit of the nail beds. That is what we define as jaundice, all right? And the reason why it's like that is the bilirubin. Usually in jaundice, a bilirubin builds up. And as that bilirubin starts building up in the circulation, it gets deposited into various different tissues. Those tissues, the sclera, it loves to bind into the sclera because there's elastin proteins in there. It binds onto the skin tissue, and it also binds into the nails and even some of the mucous membranes. So that's what we're going to define as jaundice. It's just a yellowing hue or pigmentation of the skin, sclera, mucous membranes, and the nail beds. Now, one cause of this jaundice that builds up the bilirubin is usually due to excessive hemolysis. So we're going to say that this is called, I know I'm short, don't laugh at me, hemolytic jaundice. We're going to call it hemolytic jaundice. Now, hemolytic jaundice, there's, there's two types if you really want to be specific. We're not trying to go crazy. I'm just trying to get the basic point uh, for this jaundice. There can be intravascular and extravascular. Again, not necessarily super crucial to us understanding this, but if you really want to know, extravascular is usually, it's primarily happening in the spleen. Okay, so extravascular is primarily happening in the spleen. So usually the patient will show splenomegaly, okay, enlarged spleen. And that's more common for people who have a lot of like membrane defects in the red blood cells, like maybe a G6PDH deficiency, or maybe spherocytosis, um, maybe even certain types of situations, like there's a bacteria E. coli that can cause very rare, but it can cause a hemolytic uremic syndrome. So there's different situations like that. Intravascular is more common with like mismatched blood transfusions, um, other situations uh, that can actually lead to that as well, okay? So that is the big thing here. Now, why would this cause jaundice? Let's think very quickly. Let's come back over here to this diagram because it's really important that we understand it. Let's assume that for whatever the reason might be, whatever it might be, this macrophage is breaking down tons and tons of red blood cells. As it breaks down tons and tons of red blood cells, it breaks down hemoglobin a lot into heme and globin. The heme gets broken down into bilirubin. So if we have a lot of red blood cell breakdown, we have a lot of heme breakdown, we have a lot of bilirubin, a lot of bilirubin, and a lot of unconjugated bilirubin. Then that elevated unconjugated bilirubin, that will be one big sign in the blood. You look in the blood, they're probably going to have a high unconjugated bilirubin. That'll get taken up by the liver. It'll get modified and put into the biliary system, go down through the biliary system and produce some urobilinogen or some stercobilin. Now, when you look at a patient, obviously you need to do a history and a physical exam and all that stuff, but let's say that you do some lab work, and when you do the lab work, you, do, um, you check their hematocrit, and you notice that their hematocrit is low. They have a low hematocrit. In other words, it's less than 45%, okay? You notice that first off. Then let's say that you check their hemoglobin, and their hemoglobin is also low. That's one big sign to knowing if they might have hemolytic-induced jaundice. Um, so that's the big thing. Obviously, there's another thing that goes hand in hand with the hemoglobin we talked about in the protein uh, synthesis, uh, the liver physiology. 
uh, the liver makes a protein called haptoglobin. Haptoglobin will bind onto free hemoglobin that can come from natural hemolysis. But if there's increased or excessive hemolysis, the haptoglobin is going to have to bind onto a ton of different hemoglobin molecules. So what do you think is going to happen? The haptoglobin level, the free haptoglobin level, is going to drop because it's going to be bound to tons and tons of hemoglobin. So obviously another thing that goes hand in hand with this is that the haptoglobin level, uh, the free form of it, is going to be low. Okay? So they'll have a low hemoglobin, they'll have a low uh, red blood cell count or hematocrit. Now, the next thing is, what about the bilirubin? Let's write this into the, the, this way. Let's write total bilirubin. So let's write total bili, okay? Total bili is gonna be for the bilirubin. Let's keep track of the three types, the unconjugated or the indirect, the conjugated direct, and even a little bit of the uh, urobilinogen. So if we follow this, if we look at the, the guy, we'll say here, I'm gonna put D bili, ID Billy, and then Euro Billy. Okay, and this is Euro, urinary, let's put Eurobilinogen. Eurobilinogen. Okay, what would you see here? For the direct Billy, you're not going to really see any increase in that. It might just be normal. And the reason why is the liver is actually going to be taking up this bilirubin and conjugating it and stuff like that. And there's no issue with the liver cell. It's an issue where there's excessive hemolysis. So you're not going to really see any conjugated, a lot of uh, d bili very elevated. So this will probably be normal. We'll put an N for normal. The indirect bili or the unconjugated bilirubin, we're having a lot of hemolysis. So we're going to expect this to be pretty high in the blood. So when you check their blood, you're going to notice that this is probably going to be a little bit elevated. Another thing is they're going to have a lot of this uh, conversion of the bilirubin into the conjugated bilirubin and then eventually into urobilinogen. If you're having a lot of bilirubin being pushed into this area, a lot of it's going to go into forming stercobilin. And they might have a darker feces, that might be another sign that you can see here. But one of the big things is that you're going to have a lot of urobilinogen production which is going to get taken up by the liver, but more of it can go to the kidneys. So what do you expect? They might have a little bit of a darker urine. So this might be slightly elevated, okay? Now, let's go to the next thing. The liver has these special enzymes, super important enzymes that are usually markers of cellular damage. These enzymes, there are two big types here, okay? Let's write them right here. One is called ALT, and the other one is called AST. What do these enzymes stand for? ALT is alanine aminotransferase. AST is aspartate aminotransferase, or transaminase. Okay, these are really important in amino acid metabolism. We have a video on that in our biochemistry playlist if you want to see that. But these are usually markers of cell injury. If the cells are injured, the liver is injured, then the cell becomes leaky. And if the cell becomes leaky, let's assume that here's this little leaky spot there. These AST and these ALT enzymes can leak out of the cell and into the, the actual blood. And that's why if you look at their blood plasma and you see elevated ALT and AST levels, that must mean that the liver is being damaged because there's a lot of these enzymes leaking out into the blood. But in this case, with the hemolytic, we're assuming that there's no problem with their liver. So what are you going to expect their AST levels and their ALT levels to look like? It should be normal, okay? So they should have AST, ALT levels that are normal. There's other enzymes. I'm going to call them bile duct enzymes or biliary enzymes. There are these two little guys here located within the biliary system. They're really important. What are these guys? Okay, the A, the A here is representing alkaline, phosphatase. Okay? Alkaline phosphatase. And the G is representing gamma glutamyl, glutamyl transpeptidase. Okay? I'm going to refer to this one a lot as ALP and this one as GGT. Okay? Here's the thing. These guys are usually membrane-bound on the biliary duct system, 
Okay, so here's these cholangiocytes, the bile ducts. They're usually membrane-bound enzymes, and they have a bunch of different uh, functions, right? For example, the GGT is responsible for transferring a, a glutamyl group to different amino acids to help them to be taken up into the different liver, uh, into these cholangiocytes that are into the liver cells, okay? Various different cells, but primarily into the cholangiocytes. Purpose of that is to prevent there from being a lot of proteins there in the biliary system because bacteria can actually use that as a nutrient source and overgrow. So that, that's one big thing there with the GGT. It helps with the amino acid transport across the cell membrane. So we're looking at these two enzymes. These are usually enzymes indicative of some type of biliary injury or obstruction of the biliary flow. Is there any situation with that? No, there's a normal flow here. There's normal uh, functioning there. So we would expect these enzymes, the GGT and the ALP enzymes, to be normal. Okay, the last thing is if you look with the liver is what is one more thing that we're gonna see? Well, we said that they're gonna have a lot of uh, red blood cell breakdown. Unfortunately, whenever you break down this actual red blood cell, sometimes, unfortunately, you leak a little bit more hemoglobin into the actual uh, circulation. And so sometimes because of that, that hemoglobin is actually gonna get taken up by the kidneys and it can be excreted. So what you'll see sometimes is you'll see that they might have some hemoglobin in the urine. And that can be indicative that there is a lot of red blood cell breakdown and that hemoglobin, it's being lysed and being released into the circulation. Usually this is indicative of like intravascular hemolysis. But again, I just want us to get the basic thing here. It's usually some type of hemolytic jaundice. So if you look, they might have hemoglobin urea, which is hemoglobin in the urine, hemoglobin in urine. So that is one big thing for this. Now, this last box is just giving you an idea of what are some of the causes. What are some causes um, of this hemolytic anemia? Again, it could be maybe a mismatch blood transfusion of some form. I'm just giving a couple of these. Um, it might be some type of infectious situation like hemolytic uremic syndrome. There's even snake bites. Like if you get bit by certain snakes, certain snakes have the ability, their venom can actually cause lysis of the red blood cells. So we can even just throw in there as a kick um, certain venoms. Or it could be certain types of uh, genetic defects like membrane defects, okay? Excuse me. And uh, for example, these could be a spherocytosis. Okay. There's a bunch of other types like G6PDH deficiency. There's even another one called um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. That's another type that can actually uh, come up. But again, these are just, uh, I'm just kind of getting the point across that these are some of the situations that you might come across as causes or etiologies of this uh, hemolytic jaundice. Okay, now we go on to the one that people see a lot of usually, the more common. This next jaundice is I want us to focus on the liver, okay? So because we're focusing on the liver, we're focusing on what can happen to these hepatocytes. So now let's talk about the hepatocytes and their effect now. So this can be called hepatocellular induced jaundice, hepatocellular jaundice. Now. For whatever reason with hepatocellular jaundice, what could be some causes? Let's do that first and then we'll talk about some of these situations here. What could be a few causes of this type of jaundice? Obviously, let's keep it simple, guys. We know that there's some rare diseases out there, but one of the most common is obviously alcohol-induced liver injury, right? So let's put ETOH-induced liver injury. That is obviously, of all of these, probably one of the most common. Another thing could be infectious. So it could be some type of infectious liver injury. For example, what kind? Well, it could be viral. It could be bacterial. It could be parasitic. 
right? So for example, let's just name a couple. Obviously, you guys should all know viral hepatitis viruses, A through F, but again, more commonly A and B and C and D are usually the more common ones that can happen. A and B a little bit more too. Um, what other viruses? Not just hepatitis viruses. You know, there's cytomegaloviruses. Um, there's even herpes simplex viruses, uh, varicella zoster, um, there's Epstein-Barr virus. There's so many different types of viruses other than the hep viruses that can cause a lot of liver injury. What about bacterial? Um, you know people who actually like uh, work in certain like uh, sewage and uh, waters, like where there's a lot of rats who poop in the water? There can be a lot of bacteria that can cause a condition called leptospirosis. Or people who have syphilis, like the tryponema politum, that can also affect the liver. Parasitic, there's so many different types. There's one of them, um, People can get whenever they go into the different rice fields. There's the snails that have a certain type of uh, liver fluke. It's called the schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis mansoni is usually the main one. That can also cause a lot of damage to the liver. So these can be certain causes, all right? What are other reasons? Could be autoimmune. There is certain people that have autoimmune uh, hepatitis, okay? So it could be autoimmune hepatitis. Let's, uh, ooh, what about vascular issues? What if somebody has Bud Chiari syndrome? What, if, what the heck is Bud Chiari syndrome? Bud Chiari syndrome is a situation in which there is the occlusion of the hepatic veins, the, the veins that are draining the liver. What if those are occluded and they can't drain the liver properly? What's going to happen? The liver cells are going to be damaged. And as the liver cells are damaged over time, that can cause a lot of this hepatocellular injury. Another one is what if the liver isn't getting enough oxygen? What if there is uh, some type of uh, liver shock, right? Like some type of circulatory, circulatory shock of some form. Low oxygen delivery, right? So low oxygen delivery to the tissues. That can also cause some hepatocellular injury. Another one, not as common, but some metabolic diseases. So what if there is metabolic injury? Okay, so metabolic. Uh, hepatitis. So for example, uh, there it could be induced by iron, it could be induced by copper, iron a little bit more common, but again you've heard of hemochromatosis, a buildup of iron within the actual liver and other tissues, or copper buildup, which is going to be Wilson's disease. These can be certain things that cause a lot of damage to the liver and uh, can actually cause the liver to become damaged to the point to where some of that bilirubin starts leaking into the actual blood plasma. So now, with that being said, let's kind of follow this here. Let's go back to the actual uh, bilirubin. Let's say that the liver is, what is it responsible for? It's responsible for taking the bilirubin up, conjugating it, and then excreting it. So whenever you look at that, just this part right here, what is in the liver? There's a mixture. There's a mixture of unconjugated bilirubin, and there can be a mixture of conjugated bilirubin. So because of that, you have to understand that when we look at their total bilirubin, when we look at their total bilirubin, they might have kind of a mixture of stuff here. So for example, their d -bili. Let's say we look at their d or their conjugated bilirubin. That could be elevated. So that might be elevated. What about their unconjugated bilirubin? That could also be elevated. Okay, so if we look at the other one, the indirect bili, that could also be slightly elevated. What about the urobilinogen? Okay, well, we're saying that there's liver injury. If there's liver injury, then the actual what? Are we gonna be able to put a lot of bilirubin out into this area? No. If we're not able to put a lot of bilirubin out into this area, are we gonna be able to metabolize a lot of that bilirubin into urobilinogen? No. So we might see a small decrease, a small decrease in the urobilinogen. So we might see a small decrease. I'm going to put there small decrease in the urobilinogen. In some cases, it might actually be slightly normal, OK? OK, now let's go to the next thing. Let's go back to these liver enzymes. These liver enzymes, we're assuming that there is liver damage now. So the, the cells are being damaged, their cell membranes are becoming leaky, and it's leaking these enzymes out into the actual circulation. So what are you going to expect the AST and ALT levels to be? We're going to expect these guys to be elevated. Now, all right, a lot of you guys have been asking about the liver function test and stuff. Again, we're trying to get some basic things in here, not going ham on this, but if there is a hepatocellular injury due to any of these causes, what are you going to expect the liver enzymes to be? 
super elevated. Now, I need to make a point here. ALT, I want you to remember, AL, that's liver. This one is specific to the liver, specific to liver, okay? So for example, if there's infectious, okay? If there's maybe some type of bud, like circulatory issue, bud Chiari syndrome or circulatory shock or metabolic hepatitis of that form, these usually will result in an elevated ALT. But here's where I want us to be very, very careful. AST is nonspecific. It's usually nonspecific. And the reason why is AST is actually present in other tissues, like the brain, the muscles, the pancreas, various different tissues. So saying that it's just specific to the liver, that's not the case. It can be made by various tissues. For example, if someone had a myocardial infarction, their AST levels are going to be elevated, but that's not the marker that we go by. We usually go by troponin levels and um, creatine kinase levels as well. But AST is very, very important for one thing that you guys got to remember with these. AST, when it is greater than the ALT by two times, so for example, it's a two to one ratio. If the AST is two times the amount of the ALT liver enzyme level, this is indicative of ethanol or alcohol damage. Okay? So that is really important that you guys remember that. One other thing, if you see the ALT and the AST levels in thousands, that's pretty freaking high, just for you guys to know. If you see the ALT and the AST levels are very, very elevated in the thousands, please remember that it is most likely acute viral hepatitis, usually A and B. If it's a little lower, like let's say it's less than four in the 400s, like less than that, it's usually can be chronic hepatitis, all right? But usually if you start seeing the liver enzyme super, super high, it's usually indicative of acute viral hepatitis. All right, so again, in hepatocellular damage, you're gonna see elevated ALT and AST, but remember, ALT is more sensitive or specific to the liver. AST is made by other tissues. One big thing is that the AST, when it is super elevated, at least two times the level of the ALT, that is usually indicative of alcohol-induced liver injury. I wanna just explain very briefly why. In the liver cells, you have the mitochondria. In the mitochondria, guess what enzyme you have in there? AST. When there's a lot of alcohol induced injury, guess what the, you actually have a lot of? Reactive oxygen species. Guess what that does? That damages the mitochondria because of the alcohol use. The reactive oxygen species damage the mitochondria and what does it leak out? The AST. That's why it's a little bit more specific for the alcohol injury. Okay, so we got that. Now let's go to these other enzymes. The uh, alkaline phosphatase and the GGT. Let's assume that there's liver injury, but it's in the acute phases. If it's in the acute phases, let's assume that the liver cell, the liver hasn't inflamed to the point to where it's actually compressing the bile ducts. But then let's say that we go over a long period of time, chronic hepatitis. Over a long period of time, what's gonna start happening? The liver cells are gonna start getting a little bit bigger and bigger and start gonna start pressing down. The liver's gonna become super inflamed. And a lot of these intrahepatic ducts are gonna be compressed, which is gonna cause the reflux Let's imagine that there's cells here that is compressing this guy. It's gonna cause the reflux of these enzymes into the blood. But this is chronic cases. So remember, in chronic hepatitis, you will see slightly elevated GGT, and you might see slightly elevated alk -fos, or alkaline phosphatase levels, okay? One more <clears throat> for this, sorry. Let's say that the liver has an acute liver injury, right? Acute liver injury, all right? So again, there was some type of uh, viral hepatitis, okay? Usually after a little bit of time, okay? Let's, again, acute, but like, let's say that to the point to where the liver, its protein synthetic function starts dropping. There's particular proteins in the liver that are good indicators that we can use as diagnostic tools that there is some type of acute liver damage. The liver, if you guys remember, is responsible for secreting tons of different types of clotting factors. Some of the big ones was factor two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10. All of these guys will put into the circulation and help with clotting. If you remember, they were important because they were vitamin K dependent. If there's acute liver injury, when you do what's called a prothrombin time, so acute, 
you'll do what's called a prothrombin time. In other words, you're going to determine how long it takes for them to clot. That'll be elevated. Okay, they'll have a prolonged prothrombin time. But then if they have chronic hepatitis, chronic, long-term injury, to the point to where the liver's protein synthetic function starts decreasing significantly, one of the big proteins that you'll start seeing a decrease in this is not a good prognostic sign, is you'll see a drop in albumin. And again, if there's hypoalbuminemia, hypoalbumin, hypoalbuminemia, that is usually gonna say that there's not a lot of proteins to hold a lot of the water in the blood vessels. If that's the case, what's gonna happen, a lot of that water's gonna leak out into the interstitial spaces and start causing edema. So what's one sign that you might start seeing with these people is you might start seeing edema and, and as well as the other characteristic signs of liver injury like, you know, um, some of the uh, peri umbilical veins are gonna be starting to distend, maybe some esophageal varices, some ascites, different things like that, okay? <clears throat> so that's the big thing to remember here with the hepatocellular injury. Now let's go to the last guy here and this last type here of jaundice is usually um, obstructive in nature, okay? So it's usually some type of cholestatic. Let's actually do that. Let's say cholestatic induced jaundice. Cholestasis um, is basically any impaired uh, bile formation or impaired bile flow. So remember that cholestasis is the impaired bile formation or impaired bile flow, whether it be intrahepatic or extrahepatic. So what could be some causes? Let's think here simply. Let's say that <clears throat> there is uh, a lot of uh, fibrosis, okay, uh, of these actual biliary vessels. So what if there is actually fibrosis? So let's write one cause here. One cause could be maybe some biliary fibrosis. That could be one cause. What about sometimes in certain situations the gallbladder produces these stones and let's assume that maybe there's a stone here, a gallstone, that actually starts occluding the bile flow and the bile starts backing up. What is that called? Gallstones. So let's say that there's some type of gallstones. What if there is another condition? in which in certain situations the biliary ducts fail to completely form or they narrow. They narrow really bad. This is called biliary atresia. It's where the actual bile ducts fail to form properly. So this can cause biliary atresia. What if there's a tumor? What if there's actually some type of tumor here, or carcinoma, of the actual biliary duct system. So what if there's some type of tumor? So what if there is a biliary tumor? Or what if there's a pancreatic tumor within the head of the pancreas that's compressing the hepatopancreatic ampulla? So what if there's also a uh, pancreatic tumor of some form? Any of these situations, I want you guys to just realize that anything that can impair the bile flow. So what if, again, what if there's a tumor right here in the head of the pancreas and it's obstructing the bile flow? All right. Any of these situations could be common causes of this type of cholestatic jaundice. Now, when we look at this type of cholestatic jaundice, let's follow the billy. This one is usually the easiest one. When you're trying to diagnose this type of patient, the first thing that you should do is you should do a UA, a dipstick. And when you do the dipstick, one thing that you're gonna see is, is they are going to have pretty much no urobilinogen, or very, very little. Why? Follow the bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin, this isn't affected. Conjugated bilirubin, this part is not affected, we're assuming. It can be secreted, but is it able to be pushed into the actual intestines? No. If it's not able to be in, in, put, pushed into the intestines, can it form stercobilin? No. Can we reabsorb it in the form of urobilinogen and make that into urobilin in the urine? No. So what is some signs gonna be? That should make sense, right? You're gonna see that in these patients, they're, they, might have, they might have some conjugated, because a lot of the stuff is gonna be backflowing. They're conjugated, actually, let's keep, stick with the situation here, total billy, they have total billy. 
let's say that the direct bilirubin, this might be slightly elevated. Let's put here like slightly elevated. The indirect bili might be slightly elevated. But the urobilinogen, this is the big indicator. This is the one I want you guys to not, uh, not forget. This one is going to be really, really low or absent. This is the defining diagnostic tool here is that if you check the UA, you do a dipstick and you see that the urobilinogen is pretty much there, uh, not there, is completely absent, that is a good diagnostic sign that they might have some type of obstructive jaundice. Another thing that you should look at with respect to this is look at their feces. If they're not able to put out uh, the bilirubin, can it cause the feces to become more pigmented? No. So because of that, what will happen to their feces? They're going to have white turds, okay? They're going to have white turds. And that is going to be because there's no, what? It's going to be more white or clayish color. I'm just kind of emphasizing it to make it fun here, but it's going to be more clay colored because they're not going to have the stercobilin to cause the brown pigment in the feces. That's one identifier as well. Okay, let's go to the next thing. What about the liver enzymes, the ALT and the AST? The ALT and the AST, they might be slightly elevated, but it's only because as there's actually this uh, biliary system here, these guys, they're gonna be, uh, what happens is as the actual bile starts actually becoming backflowed, it can cause a little bit of liver damage over time and can lead to some of these enzymes being released into the circulation. Big indicator though, don't forget these, is you're going to have elevated ALP levels and elevated GGT levels. And another thing is, is your bilirubin. Another indicator is that you want your bilirubin, you want that to be elevated and at least greater in representation than the AST and the ALT. You, these are usually elevated but again, the bili is usually a little bit greater, more elevated as compared to the AST and ALT because there is going to be a lot of D-bili and uh, indirect bilirubin. Again, conjugated bilirubin, unconjugated bilirubin in the actual blood plasma that are going to be elevated there, okay? Another thing that you're going to want to take into consideration here when you're looking at liver injury uh, due to this cholestatic effect Alkaline phosphatase, this guy is actually present in other tissues. So here, let me do a little thing here for ALP. ALP can be found in like the bone, it can be found in the liver, and it can even be found in your GIT. So because of that, whenever there's damage, whenever there's some type of issue with the bone, there's issue with the liver, or there's an issue with the GIT, these enzymes can be elevated. So you have to make sure that whenever you're doing this blood work and you look at their alkaline phosphatase levels, if it's elevated, make sure that you compare it with the GGT. Why? Let's say that you look at the ALP and it's elevated, but then you look at their GGT and it's normal. So let's say here, let's say the ALP is elevated, but the GGT is normal. This means that there is no issue with the liver. It's most likely something to do with the bone or the GIT. Okay, for example, in the bone, maybe there's some type of a situation where there's a lot of bone turnover. But if there is an elevated ALP and an elevated GGT, then this is usually a good sign in showing that there, well, it's not a good sign, but it's, it's usually indicative, okay, that there is some type of cholestasis uh, that's causing this jaundice, okay? One other thing with the GGT is the GGT is also elevated in ethanol-induced liver injury. So you can add that to there whenever you look at um, the situation with the AST. So now let's write that down over here um, as this note over here. This last whole thing that I want to point out here is that again, if your ALP is elevated but the GGT is normal, it's not liver. If ALP is elevated and GGT is elevated, then it most likely is some type of cholestatic liver injury. And then one more thing to go with this AST and ALT 
is that remember, when we said that whenever there's any ethanol-induced injury, AST is usually two times greater than the AOT levels, and they're both elevated. That is indicative of ethanol injury. Don't forget that GGT is also an indicator of liver injury due to ethanol or alcohol-induced. One last thing I gotta talk about. There is certain disorders that are familiar disorders. We obviously talked about one, the Dubin-Johnson syndrome, and we mentioned another one called Rotor syndrome. I can write it up right here, Rotor syndrome. Again, not something that's significant to know, but it's usually a defect in the OATP uh, uh, protein, which causes elevated, conjugated, and unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And that's just high bilirubin in the blood. And then there's Dubin-Johnson. There is another one that should be mentioned, and it's with respect to the UGT. Okay, I'm gonna write here UGT. And again, this stands for UDP glucuronosyl transferase. There is two types of disorders here. One is called Gilbert's syndrome. And the other one is called Krigler Najjar syndrome. Okay? And this has a type 1 and a type 2. Gilbert syndrome is usually, both of these are usually kind of like, this one can be a little bit, can be pretty severe though. But Gilbert syndrome is usually pretty benign. My, my brother has Gilbert syndrome. Uh, you guys didn't need to know that, but still, it is a situation in which there is a decreased UGT activity. If there is decreased UGT activity, what that means is this enzyme isn't able to convert the unconjugated into conjugated bilirubin. So what are you going to start seeing? It is, but it's not going to be enough. So what you're going to see is you might see a little bit of unconjugated bilirubin a little bit elevated in the actual circulation. So that's important to remember. Again, this is usually benign. It can become exacerbated if there's a severe alcohol-induced injury or severe stress or uh, infections of some form. But again, usually pretty benign. krigler najjar syndrome is usually divided into two types. And type 1 is the severe one. This is the bad one. This is no UGT activity. Okay? And then type 2 is very, very low UGT activity. Okay? It's still high enough to be benign, okay, be, to be benign to not cause severe issues. Again, if there's a lot of trauma to the liver or alcohol-induced or uh, infections, then it can become a little bit lower and stuff. But uh, generally, this one is not the severe one. The type 1 is the severe one. It can be very fatal. Reason why is if there's completely no UGT activity, then all of that bilirubin that we're actually breaking down from the red blood cells, all of that bilirubin can't be converted into conjugated bilirubin. In other words, it can't be excreted. So this unconjugated bilirubin starts building up, building up, building up, building up inside of the actual circulation. And here's the dangerous thing. He likes to go up here to your central nervous system and he deposits into the brain tissue. You know where the basal ganglia is? The lentiform nucleus, the globus pilitis, right? With the putamen and the subthalamus, all that structure's there. It likes to deposit into that area of the brain, especially in the younger ages when the blood-brain barrier isn't completely formed. And it can produce what's called kernic terrace. So as a result here, one of the dangerous effects of it getting into the central nervous system is it can produce what's called kernic terrace. And that's whenever the bilirubin is built up in the brain, it can cause a lot of encephalopathy, a lot of problems. It can even affect the third nerve, it can cause lethargy, a lot of different types of negative effects there. Okay, so that's the situation with Krigler and Najjar syndrome. There is one other thing that can happen too, and that's usually with respect to babies. Whenever you're born, you don't really have a lot of activity of this UGT enzyme. And sometimes uh, you can get what's called chloramphenicol as an antibiotic when they're really, really young. And the chloramphenicol actually inhibits this enzyme from functioning. And because of that, the bilirubin starts building up in the blood. And it actually causes the, the children to turn, take on this gray color. It's called gray baby syndrome. Okay, and it's usually due to the administration of chloramphenicol whenever they're young and they have a low glucuronic, glucuronic uh, capacity or function. 
And this can actually become pretty fatal if not treated quickly. It can actually cause the circulatory system to completely collapse. Okay, so it can be a pretty negative effect there. All right, so that pretty much covers everything that we're gonna need to know about the hepatobiliary system and the types of jaundice. All right, engineers, in this video, we talked so much about uh, the hepatobiliary system and types of jaundice. I truly do hope it made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. I hope you guys learned a lot. Um, I'm sorry that it was long. It was just trying to get as much of this information packed in as we possibly could to help it make sense for you guys. Um, if you guys did like this video, please hit that like button, uh, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance, please go check out our Facebook, our Instagram, even our Patreon account. If you guys have the opportunity to donate, we would truly appreciate it. It helps us to continue to make videos for you guys. Uh, as always, engineers, until next time.